Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about something very seasonal. We're going to be talking about reindeer and where they got their names. Indeed. So this, of course, is our holiday episode in the lead up to Christmas and the many other celebrations of the darkest, most awful time of the year. (laughs) (laughs) Most wonderful time of the year. Well, we have to have the the song goes. Come on. (laughs) We have to have the parties because otherwise it's so horrifying, at least in the northern hemisphere. Yes. I'm I'm not against winter, but I'm against dark. I don't like the darkness. (laughs) So yes, we're going to be talking about our video from last year, which was about the eight reindeer. Mm -hmm. Or nine reindeer. Yes, the reindeer, Santa's reindeer. It was about Santa's reindeer and their names. We don't have very much to get to first, but one thing, especially since it's the festive season and the season of gifts, we wanted to say a general thank you to all of our Patreon supporters, all of the patrons, new and old. We have some new ones at the $1 level recently, and we appreciate them very, very much. Thank you all. And of course, if you're interested in contributing to the Patreon, it's at patreon.com slash endless not. But really, we do just want to say thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it really makes things possible. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's also a really big vote of confidence. Yes. It makes us feel mm-hmm. like what we're doing is interesting. And we appreciate that. But we also, of course, appreciate everyone who listens, whether or not you are mm-hmm. a Patreon supporter. If you've come to us because you listened to one of our podcasts where we were interviewing uh, someone at Sound Education, that is when we were talking to Ryan Stitt of the History of Ancient Greece podcast. Or Kevin Stroud of the History of English podcast. Welcome. Thank you. And I hope that you find other episodes interesting as well. And we're thrilled if you came. Or if you listened to Mark's episode with Lexitecture. Indeed. Which, if you haven't listened to that... You definitely should. I talk about the word sad... But it was a very happy conversation. And the Lexitecture podcast, of course, is the podcast with Amy and another Ryan, (laughs) uh, which we've mentioned before, but we'll put a link in the show notes, of course. And they always do a discussion of two words, usually. The etymologies of two words. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. they're always fascinating and quite charming. Mm -hmm. And you should definitely check that out. And if you want to hear Mark talk to them and then other episodes as well. They also have an episode with Kevin Stroud. Indeed. All right. So the only other thing to say is that if you are interested in more Christmassy information and words and etymologies, we'll put a link in the show notes to our playlist of Christmas videos from years past, if you haven't heard us talk about those. Of course, we have podcast episodes on those as well. It's harder to do a playlist, but I will put links to the previous Christmas episodes in our show notes as well. And there will, of course, be a new Christmas video coming out very soon after you hear this podcast, unless you're listening to this podcast in the distant future, in which case I'd be amazed if podcasting still exists. Do (laughs) they still celebrate Christmas in in the year (laughs) 30,000? More importantly, probably the new video will get out before Christmas 2018. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just thinking, I hope you have a lot of elves working on it, Mark. (laughs) And that's everything I think we have to do before we get to the meat of the episode. Except. Of course. We're having cocktails. Yes. So this one, there was actually quite a lot of different options. We have gone for the Rudolph cocktail. It (laughs) seems appropriate. Indeed. And if you don't usually check out our pictures, you should go to the blog to see the picture of this cocktail because... It's really all about the presentation. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) They're little reindeer. (laughs) Cocktail glass reindeer. I think they were pretty cute. Uh, We had to adapt it slightly. The recipe that we found is Godiva white chocolate liqueur, vanilla vodka, and cream. Hmm. However, I couldn't get Godiva white chocolate liqueur, and the person at the liquor store said they hadn't had it for ages. So then there was no chocolate cream liqueur at all, which Hmm. was really quite surprising. It is surprising. So I got maple cream liqueur which is a whiskey and maple and cream, maple syrup, and from from Quebec, the Sortilège uh, maple cream. And we've put that in with the vanilla vodka and a little bit of creme de cacao, which is chocolate flavored. Right. So there is chocolate and then normal whipping cream. So that's what it is. So happy holidays. Oh, oh, oh. that's not bad. Mm-hmm. It's dessert in a glass, mm-hmm. of course, as one would expect. But yeah. Try the cherry. <laughs> 
don't know. How will Rudolph find his way home in the, in the blizzard now? In the fog? <laughs> <laughs> eaten his nose. <laughs> I've got to say, I probably like it better with that than with the chocolate. I do like maple. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Well, that's exceedingly tasty. Extremely sweet. If you don't like sweet cocktails, this one's not for you. But if you are in the mood for something that's essentially dessert. It's, it's like eating the melted ice cream in the bottom of your bowl. Yep. yep pretty much exactly like that. Which I like. So, <laughs> sounds good to me. Now, shall we turn our attention to Santa's reindeer and find out about them with the voiceover to the video? Indeed. Let's start with the word reindeer itself. The second element is simple enough, right? A deer is a member of the family Cervidae, a type of ruminant mammal. Except the word deer didn't always refer to that animal. The Old English form of the word is deor and could be used to refer to any sort of animal. This use may have even survived into early modern English, as in the line from Shakespeare's King Lear, mice and rats and other such small deer, though this may have been something of a joke. Interestingly, the Proto-Indo-European root of deer means to blow or puff or rise in a cloud as dust, vapour or smoke, and has a great many English derivatives such as fume, time in reference to its strong smell, dizzy, deaf, dumb, and dummkopf. Literally, dumbhead in German, in reference to defective perception or wits, and dove for its smoky colour. So literally, a deer is a breathing thing, and the word animal, from Latin, has the same semantic progression, coming from a root meaning breath. And isn't it appropriate that the reindeer is a cognate of dove, another Christmas-related animal that frequently appears as a tree ornament symbolising peace? But what about the first part of reindeer? Well, it has nothing to do with reins, as in the harness for a horse though Santa does use reins to steer his reindeer. In fact, it's a reference to the antlers, from a root care, meaning horn, which also gives us the word horn, as well as the cladistic family name Cervidae, from Latin carewus, deer. Indeed, that first element as Old English hran and Old Norse hrain were used by themselves to refer to reindeer. Another word we get from the root care is heart, not the blood pumping organ, but the word for a male deer. The Old English form of this word is heret, which was also the name of the hall of the Danes under King Hrothgar in the epic poem Beowulf, described as high and horn-gabled, either because the gables were adorned with horns or looked like antlers. Speaking of antlers, reindeers are the only species of cervids in which both males and females grow them. What's more, the male reindeers lose their antlers after the mating season in late fall, whereas the females keep them until they calve the following summer and the antlered females have the highest rank in the feeding hierarchy during that period, useful since they're gestating offspring. So if you see a picture of Santa's reindeer with antlers, you can be sure they're all female. But before we leave behind the etymology of reindeer, I should point out that another word for the species, usually used in Canada, is caribou, coming from the Mi'kmaq word kalipu, which means literally it shovels snow, because the animals kick the snow in order to feed on the moss and grass underneath. So we should all be referring to them as caribou since Santa, at the North Pole, lives in Canada. He even has a Canadian postal code, H0H0H0, where you can send your wish list to Santa and get a reply. So turning to Santa's reindeer in particular, well, originally they weren't. Reindeer, that is. Earlier depictions of Old Saint Nick had him going about on foot or on a white horse. In fact, still to this day, in the Dutch tradition, Sinterklaas rides a white horse called Amerigo. It wasn't until an obscure 1821 anonymous poem published in a New York magazine called The Children's Friend that Santa was connected with reindeer. But just one reindeer. The poem goes, Old Santa Claus with much delight his reindeer drives you this frosty night o'er chimney tops and tracks of snow to bring his yearly gifts to yo, uh, you. Now the first question is, why reindeer? Where did the New York poet get that idea, as it wasn't part of the traditional St. Nicholas legends, and New York is a long way from reindeer? Well, one suggestion is that it might come from Lapland legends of a kind of old man winter who would drive his reindeer down from the mountains bringing the snow with them. This is a general winter figure though, not a Christmas gift giver. But the name of the Finnish Christmas gift giver, now more or less conflated with the North American Santa Claus, Yulupuki, literally means Yule Goat. Yule was originally the old Germanic pagan, specifically Norse, midwinter festival that eventually got subsumed into Christmas, when Christianity arrived on the scene. In Norse myth, Thor's chariot is pulled by two goats, called Tangrisnir, teeth bearer, and Tangnoster, teeth grinder, and these names are sometimes rendered into English as cracker and gnasher, 
perhaps reminiscent of the first two reindeer names Dasher and Dancer, but we're getting ahead of ourselves here. In any case, I suppose goats are notionally closer to reindeer than horses. Maybe? The second question is why eight reindeer? That 1821 poem only mentions one, so how did the number grow? Well, you may have already guessed that it was in the famous poem Twas the Night Before Christmas, actually titled A Visit from St. Nicholas, that we first hear of eight tiny reindeer, who all have names. Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, Vixen, Comet, Cupid, Dawn, or Blitzen. Now leaving aside the indication that they, and St. Nicholas himself, were tiny, guess that's how we fit down the chimneys, why specifically eight reindeer? And why those names? To answer this, we need to take a quick look at the poem's author. Originally published anonymously in 1823, the poem was later attributed to scholar Clement Clark Moore, professor of Greek and Hebrew, and also writer of a huge ancient Hebrew dictionary. In keeping with all this scholarly learning, the reindeer names contain a number of rather learned allusions, and in addition to the possible goats of Thor I mentioned earlier, it may be a reference to another Norse god, Odin, that gives us the number 8. You see Odin, who is sometimes known by the name Jolnir or Yule figure, is one of the possible forerunners of the Christmas gift giver figure, and Odin rode an eight-legged horse named Sleipnir, which literally means slippy. Eight legs, eight reindeer? Well, let's have a look at the names of those eight reindeer. First up is Dasher. Dash probably comes from a Scandinavian source meaning beat or strike, hence dash to pieces, as well as move quickly, hence the hundred yard dash. The punctuation mark dash comes from the notion of a hastily written pen stroke, and from there the expletive dash it all because the curse word dam would be reproduced in print as d dash dash m, so as not to corrupt the innocent. A dashboard was the barrier in front of a carriage or sleigh which prevented mud from being dashed up from the horse's hooves and ruining the clothes of those riding in the vehicle. When the automobile or horseless carriage was invented, the dashboard was kept to protect the passengers from the dirt of the wheels, and once the engine was placed in front of the car, the dashboard protected the passengers from the heat and oil of the motor, and eventually the car's various instruments were located on the dashboard which has kept the same name in spite of the changes in meaning. The first mass-produced automobile, the Oldsmobile Curved Dash, was so named because its dashboard was curved resembling that of a sleigh. I suppose Santa's sleigh must have a dashboard too, but presumably he doesn't have to worry about mud since his sleigh flies. Another related word is dashing, meaning fashionable and showy, as in a dashing young man. This use comes from the 18th century colloquial expression to cut a dash, which I suppose you might want to do on the dance floor. Speaking of which, next up is Dancer. The etymology of dance is a bit uncertain. The word comes into English from Old French danser. Ultimately it either comes from Frankish dintyan, to tremble, or from the Proto-Indo-European root ten, meaning to pull or stretch, suggesting dancing in a line or file. I guess the reindeer are stretched out in lines when pulling Santa's sleigh, but really they should be dancing in a circle, as the word carol, possibly coming from Latin corolla meaning little crown, originally referred to a kind of circle dance performed to a particular type of lyric song so maybe Dancer was also a singer. I suppose Prance might suggest a motion similar to dancing, appropriate since Prancer is our next reindeer. Funny thing is, historically speaking, Prancer shouldn't be a reindeer but a horse. The word Prancer was originally, from the 1560s, thieves slang for a horse. Again, it's a bit uncertain where Prance comes from, but it has been possibly linked to Middle English pranken, to show off, from Middle Dutch pronken, and thereby related to the word prank. But lest you think that pranking is rather more related to another holiday, April Fool's Day, Christmas too has its own tradition of pranking and misrule. During the late Middle Ages and early modern periods there was a tradition of appointing a peasant as the Lord of Misrule, a kind of mock king who oversaw the Feast of Fools during Christmastide. This would generally involve drunkenness, wild partying, disguises, and other types of topsy-turvy revelry. It's been suggested, though not without some debate, that this custom dates back to the ancient Roman festival of Saturnalia, celebrated at the same time of year, which featured gift giving and a carnival atmosphere in which masters served their slaves. Well if Prancer should have been a horse, Vixen should have been a fox. And a girl. Because you see, Vixen is the feminine form of fox. In Old English, as in Modern English, while the male was a fox, the female was a fixin, with the feminine ending en causing the vowel to mutate, as also seen in Old English pairs like wolf male, and wilfen female. Guess that's further evidence, along with the antlers, that the reindeer were all female. As for the root of the words vixen and fox, this is a matter of some debate. We know it can be traced back as far as Proto-Germanic fuchsas, 
feminine fuchsinio, as there are cognates meaning fox in the various Germanic languages. But fuchsas does not come from the usual word for fox in Proto-Indo-European, wulpe, which leads to Latin wulpes, and thereby the scientific name for the fox. So where did fox and its cognates come from? Well, it seems to have been a taboo replacement. Instead of using the fox real name, which might invoke the pestilent creature itself, a taboo replacement name is used instead. This is a common process with animal names, such as with the word bear, which literally means brown one. The original Proto-Indo-European root referring to the bear does survive in Latin ursus, giving us the constellations Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, which mark out the Arctic, a word which comes from the Greek derivative of that same root. Well, Santa and the reindeer do live in the Arctic at the North Pole after all. Interestingly, the word bear gets swapped out again in the name of the hero Beowulf, whose name literally means bee-wolf, a stand-in for the word bear. So all that being said, what is the literal meaning of the word fox? Well, there are a number of suggestions, but the most likely is that it refers to the fox's distinctive tail, coming from the root puk, meaning tail. By the way, in another instance of sly and foxy name replacement, in French, which originally had a word descended from Latin wulpes, the standard word now is renard, which comes from a popular folk character in medieval literature, Reynard, an anthropomorphic trickster figure who is always up to no good. Indeed, the slyness of the fox is its main cultural association. I suppose that might lie behind the compound word foxfire, a kind of eerily bioluminescent fungus which is associated with the will o' the wisp and the original sense of jack-o'-lantern, mischievous fairies that lead nighttime travellers to their doom. But this is all leading us astray to yet another holiday, Halloween, so let's return to our foxy roots, specifically the one that gives us Latin wulpes. It is so close to the root that lies behind English wolf and Latin lupus that there appears to be something linguistically sly going on behind the scenes and indeed sometimes the words for foxes and wolves are used interchangeably. And as a final point on the cultural associations of the animals, in English foxy is a word that is applied to sexually attractive women. Vixen, which had the earlier sense of an ill-tempered quarrelsome woman, seems now to be gaining the sense of a sexually aggressive woman, and in Latin the feminine form lupa refers to a prostitute. But lest we cast any aspersions on our reindeer vixen, let's move on to the next reindeer in line, and that is comet. As an object flying through the heavens, the word comet seems an appropriate name for one of Santa's team. Comet comes ultimately from Greek in the expression asters cometes, meaning literally hairy star, on account of the long tail of the star which was thought to look like hair. Cometes comes from Greek kome, meaning hair of the head, and that's the end of the line as we don't know where that word comes from. In addition to comets looking hairier than other stars, they were also notable to ancient observers for being temporary moving stars. Since they came and went like that, they were often taken as portents of important events. And to bring this all back to Christmas again, it has been speculated that the Star of Bethlehem, which marked the birth of Jesus, was in fact a comet, though other astronomical objects, such as an unusual conjunction of planets or even a supernova, have been suggested. The Magi, or wise men, as they are sometimes known, were in this case likely astrologers following the star. But moving on from stars in the heavens to gods, next up is the reindeer Cupid. Cupid is of course the Roman god of desire and erotic love, which the Romans associated with the Greek god Eros. Latin cupido, desire or love, comes from the verb cupera, to desire, which goes back to a Proto-Indo-European root quep, meaning to smoke, cook, move violently, be agitated emotionally. So I suppose you could say that Cupid is really smoking. The English derivative cupidity generally refers to desire for money, not sex, but the related concupiscence does indicate sexual desire. Also possibly from this root, through Latin vapor, steam, are the words vapor and evaporate, and through vapidus, English vapid, literally, that has emitted steam or lost its vapor, flat or poor. Greek eros, by the way, may come from the root ere, meaning to separate or adjoin, which also gives us rare, through Latin raros, having intervals between, hence full of empty spaces, and thus rare. If this is the root of eros, it would then come from the Greek verb erasthai, to love, from the idea of being separated from. Well, absence does make the heart go fonder, or perhaps that should be fondler, since we're talking about erotic love here, eros also leading to English erotic and erogenous. Today, of course, we associate the god Cupid with that little cherub who flies about shooting love hours at people around St. Valentine's Day, but as we again stray into yet another holiday, I'll bring it back to wolves and Roman traditions, because some have tried, not very convincingly, to trace a line between Valentine's Day and the Roman festival Lupercalia, 
which just happens to fall on the 13th to 15th of February. Lupercalia, which draws its name from Latin lupus, wolf, is a kind of pastoral festival associated with fertility, hence the supposed connection with Valentine's Day, in which, according to the historian Plutarch, young men ran through the streets naked, hitting women who wished to become pregnant or have an easier pregnancy with shaggy thongs. Always with the men hitting on the women, it seems. Certainly makes you wonder what Cupid and Vixen were getting up to. Our next reindeer in the Pantheon is Donner, or is it? In the original Clement Clark Moore poem it's Dunder, though you needn't feel like a Dunderhead, a related word, or a Dumkopf for that matter, for not knowing that, as Donner is today the most common form of the reindeer's name. You see Dunder is the 19th century Dutch spelling for the word, which means thunder, and which goes back to the Proto-Indo-European root stene, meaning thunder, and I'm sure you'll be stunned and astonished, also related words, to hear that English thunder also comes from this root. Donner is the German form of the word. Also related is Thor, Old English Thunor, the Norse Lord of Thunder. Oops, that should be God of Thunder. Sorry Thor. And since there appear to be wolves after me in this video, I may as well mention in Norse myths Thor's father Odin meets his doom in the jaws of the monstrous wolf Fenrir, whose name means Fendweller. So I guess wolves are after them too. And what goes along with thunder? Well lightning of course. And that's the sense behind the next reindeer name, Blitzen. Only again the original poem had the Dutch form Blixem. The ultimate Proto-Indo-European root behind the word is bell, which means shine, flash, or burn, and gives us such words as bleach, blonde, and flame, as well as Beltane, the Celtic May Day celebration, yet another non-Christmas holiday. Blitzen also has some more closely related cognates in English, such as Blitzkrieg, meaning lightning war, the World War II German attack strategy which employed surprise and speed to overwhelm the opposing forces. This was then shortened simply to Blitz, especially in reference to the Blitz, the German bombing raids against Britain in World War II. But this is also not a suitable topic for Christmas so we'd best move on. Move on? But weren't there only eight reindeer? What about the most famous reindeer of all? Well, the story of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer was written by Robert May, drawing on the memories of his own painfully shy childhood, as a free Christmas promotion in 1939 for the Montgomery Ward department store, where he worked in the advertising department. Almost two and a half million copies were given out that Christmas season, and the story became a big hit virtually overnight. And in a remarkable show of corporate loyalty, the store turned over the rights to the poem to May, and it subsequently became a commercially published book. May then handed the poem over to his brother-in-law, Johnny Marks, to turn into a song, which became a hit for Gene Autry, the singing cowboy, after it was turned down by the likes of Bing Crosby and Dinah Shore, and was eventually made into a Christmas TV special in 1964. As for songwriter Marks, although he was Jewish, as was May, he made something of a career out of writing Christmas songs, composing such hits as Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree, A Holly Jolly Christmas, and Run Rudolph Run, the last for rock and roll legend Chuck Berry. As for the name itself, well it looks like the wolves have finally caught up with us and are dressed in reindeer's clothing, because Rudolph means glory wolf. The second element we've already seen, the Germanic root that produces wolf. The first element is from Hruad, a Germanic root meaning glory or fame, a common name element also found in the name Roger. That name appears in Old English as Hrothgar, literally glory spear the name of the king in Beowulf, king of the Danes and lord of the hall Harrod that we saw at the beginning of this video. Rudolf too has an Old English form, Hrothulf, who is mentioned briefly in Beowulf as the nephew of Hrothgar. These legendary figures also appear in an Old Norse saga as Hroar and Hrolfer, with the latter playing the larger role, gathering about him a court of twelve accomplished warriors, one of whom, Balfar Bjarki, whose name means warlike little bear, is often connected with Beowulf himself on account of his bearish name. Bodvar Bjarki's father was magically turned into a bear and he seems to have inherited this connection from his father as he is able to project his spirit as a giant bear in order to fight for Hrolf with bear-like powers. So it seems there's more to those tiny reindeer than meets the wandering eye, from a wild menagerie to Norse myth, Roman festivals, and Old English epic. Probably then a good idea to leave a carrot or two beside the cookies for Santa to keep on their good side. Okay, that reminded me why it, I chose the maple cream liqueur to go as a substitute for the chocolate. <laughs> because, the Canadian thing? of course, yeah. Santa is actually Canadian. Mm -hmm. There we go. I forgot to say that. So, <clears throat> sorry, just had to get that in there. <laughs> Take that, North Pole, New York, I think.
Also, and, Finland. And Finland. And I forget the, possibly the name of Norway the town in Finland. And oh, maybe Russia. No? Okay. I well, don't anyways. know. I think a fair <laughs> number of people have tried to claim Santa, Santa over yes. the years, but certainly Finland does. Yes. But if Santa is Canadian, then Rudolph is Canadian, and so a maple cocktail is completely appropriate. So exactly. there. <laughs> <laughs> and And vanilla is very Canadian, too. We grow lots of vanilla orchids <laughs> up here in the north. <laughs> So did you have any more you wanted to add to that? Yeah. So in spite of our nationalism <laughs> just now, <laughs> in fact, as I discussed in a previous Christmas video, mm -hmm. the whole Santa Claus thing was really a New York creation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit more about the authorship of Twas the Night Before Christmas or mm -hmm. A Visit from St. Nicholas, which, as I mentioned, was originally published anonymously and only later uh, attributed to uh, Clement Clark Moore. So it was originally published in 1823 mm -hmm. in the Troy, New York Sentinel. Mm -hmm. Now, let's start with Clement Clark Moore, and I'll tell you a little bit more about him. So he, he lived from 1779 to 1863, and he came from, you know, a very wealthy family and owned a big estate in Chelsea, New okay. York, which is, it's it's on Manhattan. And it's now, now, now it's a part of New York. Now it's part of New York, yeah. but it was um, at the time undeveloped and it was a big mm -hmm. country estate, basically. He was in the same group as uh, John Pintard and Washington Irving, who are also very much responsible for kicking off the whole... St. Nicholas Revival. Mm -hmm. um, St. Nicholas was, you know, an actual saint, but he became the sort of Christmas figure as a result of those New York writers. I mean, he already had a December feast day and a tradition of bringing presents. Yeah. So it, they didn't create it out of whole They cloth. didn't create it, it out of I whole I mean, cloth. there's many places that have yeah. a St. Nicholas's day and yes. that have St. Nicholas. Yes. So don't overstate there. <laughs> yes. But he became a sort of Christmas figure as a result of, you know, these this little group of he became associated with Santa Claus. With Santa Claus. Well, he became, he, he became, transformed yeah. into Santa Claus. So yes, in the Christmas stocking video, you can hear more about these other guys. But as the story goes, Moore would recite this poem from memory for his family every year at, at Christmas. Mm -hmm. But it never, it was probably never intended to go public mm. is the thing. It was just a little family thing that he did. And in fact, Moore himself he didn't claim authorship at first. Mm -hmm. He only did so later on, though somewhat diffidently, as if he wasn't too proud of it. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, he did write other things which were much more serious. Mm -hmm. And so this was, you know, seems to have been a bit of... Well, how did it get into the paper then? So it, it seems to have gotten out accidentally through one of his friends or something like that. The theory goes anyways. Okay. But he himself never intended it for publication. He later on said when he when when he finally did claim authorship of the thing that he actually got a lot of the ideas from his Dutch gardener. Hmm. Okay. So explains the which kind I mean center class. I mean it makes sense yes. that there is a there is a strong yeah. Saint Nicholas tradition in Dutch tradition, right? Yeah. But I mean, he also did know John Pintard and Washington Irving, mm -hmm. who were you know already Big developing the Nicholas, ideas. Yeah. yeah. So I would imagine that was also a major influence on what he did with the with the figure. Now, there is an alternate claim to authorship mm -hmm. that it was written by Henry Livingston Jr., who lived from 1748 to 1828, who was a Revolutionary War veteran. Mm. So a little bit older than uh, Moore. Mm -hmm. And if true, it would have come out towards his later years, mm -hmm. right? So it was, you know, came out in... 1823, he, he died in 1828, so not long before he died. Now, he never claimed, at least publicly, authorship of the poem. It's instead his family who later claimed, once it started to become popular, mm. that he had written the thing. Um, and supposedly he had written it earlier, quite a bit earlier, uh, in the first de decade of the 19th century, mm -hmm. and that it only later came out. Supposedly, he wrote it for his children, but a governess of these children asked for a copy, and it's through that that it may have gone right. out. Right. Who knew there was such a trafficking in illicit <laughs> <Christmas>. poetry? <laughs> My goodness. Indeed. 
So it is actually much more in the style of Livingston, mm. who wrote other poetry as well, uh, rather than, you know, not, it's, it's not in keeping with the usual more scholarly style of the Professor Moore, right. who was right. a professor, as I said, of, of um, Greek and Latin, yeah. Greek and, uh, no, Greek and Hebrew. Right. Sorry. So it kind of makes sense in that sense that it would be uh, Livingston's composition. And indeed, a professor at Vassar College, Professor Don Foster, did a linguistic analysis that seems to support this, that it is stylistically, right. linguistically more similar to the work of Livingston than Moore. So, you know, no one, there are arguments on both sides, and it's probably something that will not be solved unless you, you know, accept the, the mm -hmm. linguistic evidence there. But... Mm -hmm. So I, you know, this is one little detail that I left out of the video that I right, thought was right. kind of interesting. One other tiny little detail, and this is a very small kind of footnote, but it sort of entertained me. Mm -hmm. In terms of the writing of the Rudolph extension of the reindeer, mm -hmm. uh, as I said, by Robert L. May, that advertising uh, right, right. executive, he happens to be the grand uncle of Stephen Levitt of Freakonomics fame. Oh, okay. <laughs> so if you know if you know that that book and its various uh, sequels, yeah, he he's the the grand nephew of Robert May. Okay. <laughs> and one other, I guess, tiny little detail about Rudolph is that the line "All of the other reindeer" mm -hmm. it's one of these Mondegreens, yeah. right? Yeah. One of these lines in a song that you kind of mishear and reinterpret as "Olive." The other, the other reindeer. reindeer, yes. With the name Olive. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that it, someone eventually, you know, decided to turn that into reality and mm -hmm. write a, a kid's book called Olive, The Other Reindeer. Right. <laughs> so I just thought that was entertaining. It's cute. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I have a couple of other things to just riff off a bit from the classical points as you say the biggest argument other than his family or that other than him saying it was himself writing it which yes. i've got to say is a fairly strong argument mm -hmm. is is that it has these potential classical mm -hmm. references so just a couple of points of things that are maybe interesting and connected to christmas some of them saturnalia you mentioned in passing as the winter festival that it has been argued has given some elements to the Christian tradition of, of Christmas. Even if it doesn't, I think it probably springs from similar roots. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, it's one of the many expressions of a similar winter festival, winter festival of what people do the so around the solstice. Right. Whether it specifically, you know, directly influenced Christmas or not. So just a few more words about the Saturnalia, because I don't think we've really covered it in detail in any of the other episodes and it is always associated with Christmas because it started off as being celebrated on the 17th of December mm. and eventually extended to the 17th through the 23rd of December. So obviously the timing is very close. Mm -hmm. It has a couple of elements to it. There's a, it's to the god Saturn, mm -hmm. Kronos in Greek, and it does seem to have be connected to a, a festival in Greek, a uh, festival called the Kronia. But the Kronia is celebrated in July, August, so not associated with winter at all. But Kronos is, of course, the god Saturn in Greek. So or they're syncretically linked. So how different is Saturnalia from the Greek tradition? I mean, we as you know say, it's very little about the Kronia okay. from what I was looking at. Mm -hmm. So uh, it does seem to have been influenced by it seems to have been a time of feasting and, and misrule to some extent. Okay. But... I don't know. That's not something I know. I just know what I looked up very quickly. So in the Roman tradition, you it, it has some various parts, but basically there's a sacrifice at the Temple of Saturn. Mm -hmm. There's a public banquet, mm -hmm. feasting citizens at the public expense. So there's a public element and a private element. And the private element is private feasting mm -hmm. and gift giving. Right. And the other element to it is that things are allowed during the Saturnalia that are not normally allowed most notably gambling, which was technically like gambling on dice and dice playing was outlawed most of the year. Uh, that seems to have had essentially no effect on whether or not people actually played. Of course. But <laughs> it, was, it was technically legal during the Saturnalia. And you have this topsy-turviness of status. Now, there's some 
debate, we don't have a continuous, like somebody who sat down and described Saturnalia for us. Mm -hmm. It's referred to multiple times in multiple places. And so we've put together a composite picture. Some versions say that the masters served the slaves at dinner. So there was a dinner for the slaves and the masters served it. Mm -hmm. Others say the slaves are served a dinner like their masters get. Mm -hmm. And others say that the slaves get a dinner before the masters eat a good dinner. Uh, or that they dine with their masters. Okay. So uh, people often say it's switched around and the mm. masters become the slaves for a day. Maybe, but and that's maybe, only one of the versions yeah. of, of what we are told. And may have changed over time. Yeah. Or what does different... seem to be important is that there is some leveling. Right. Some leveling or inversion of the status between masters and slaves. And it's very specifically about the slaves. You know, it's not about rich and poor or whatever. It's specifically free and unfree. And the element of that that is connected to Saturn is the whole, or at least for the Romans of the period when we have writing about it, for them, the idea was that Saturn was the king during the Golden Age. Mm. He was the ruler in Italy, maybe not a human king, but, you know, the ruler in Italy or the ruler of the world when things were in their Golden Age. So he's the father of Jupiter, right? right? And that during the Golden Age, there was no such thing as slavery. Huh. And there was no such thing as, you know, poverty or anything else. Everything mm-hmm. was good. And so it's a it's a moment of return to no status differenti- right. differentiation. And that's why it's abundance and feasting and pleasure. Saturn as a god in Gre- in Italy is associated iconographically with agriculture. Mm-hmm. So one can imagine... A whole, you know, one can imagine this coming from originally feasting as a harvest festival right. or agricultural festival, or. But... And I imagine that the sort of portrayal of Saturn as the father of Jupiter only comes about through the association syncretism with, with Greece. Syncretism with Greek. Yes, but again, I don't know the, you know, what mm-hmm. evidence we have of that process right. necessarily. So the gifts and the feasting and the general revelry are obviously the things that people have always associated with Christmas as being Mm -hmm. connected to that and the date. The gifts that were exchanged, the point of them was not to show up status differences. So they were small and trivial and joke gifts or just symbolic rather than rich. You didn't want to buy something expensive for people because the whole point was it had to be something that everybody could buy. So things that were particular small figurines made of wax or pottery that were known as sigillaria. Mm-hmm. And the last day of, of Saturnalia was a market day where they set up a market with people selling these sigillaria and you could go in and buy them. But you could give other gifts. And of course, people did sometimes give rich gifts and right. all the rest of it. Or things that look trivial, but were made of silver. And we, you know, we have stories of people doing that sort of thing. But that's basically what Saturnalia was. And... It was much enjoyed by most people, though we have some people, shall we call them Roman Grinches, like Pliny, who says, oh, I have a quiet room in my house that I go to to lock myself away during Saturnalia because it's so noisy and boisterous and annoying. <laughs> so. Presumably they didn't want to uh, serve their slaves. Well, I think he just didn't <laughs> like the, it was just all oh, too much for him, it was too much. But that, yes, I'm sure I'm sure there were masters who didn't particularly enjoy it. And I'm sure many slaves had to be, dar- you know, theoretically, you were allowed to be insolent. Mm. That was part of it. You were allowed to, you know, like the fool mm-hmm. and the master. But I bet you they had to be pretty darn careful. Right. Most of the time about, you know, the next day they'd be a slave again. So don't go too far. Marshall, the uh, Roman poet, has a whole bunch of poems that he, he he sort of frames as being small gifts. So you would often give a, a little a, a note or a card or something like that with a gift or mm-hmm. as a gift. And there's also so he has an, a number of he has one that he says basically every gift I give to you and he names his friend you keep giving to your mistress. I, I give you a Saturnalia gift and then you give it to her. So basically you're purchasing her favors. He does not use the word favors. With my gifts. So my gifts are paying for your um, pleasures. Right. And he's mad about that. <laughs> he's like, you don't, it doesn't cost you anything anymore because you're just using my, my, my gifts for it. But Catullus also has a poem about Saturnalia gifts that I thought I'd just read very quickly because it's kind of entertaining. So the idea was they were supposed to be small gifts, but mm. you could use them as, as markers of affection, right? You could, sure. and, and among poets and other mm. learned people, of course, 
a, a book or something like that would be a good gift. Now, technically not a small gift because they'd probably be quite expensive. But right. if you're talking about really rich people, right. it would seem reasonable. So this is Catullus 14. And it's written to another poet, a poet that we know from other poems, mm -hmm. is a good friend of his, has the same sort of aesthetic views as he does, part mm -hmm. of his circle. If I didn't love you more than my eyes, most delightful Calvus, I'd dislike you for this gift with a true Vitinian dislike. And that's another poet he doesn't like. Yeah. Now, what did I do? And what did I say to be so badly cursed with poets? Let the gods send ill luck to that client who sent you so many wretches. But if, as I guess, Sulla the grammarian gave you this new and inventive gift, that's no harm to me. It's good and fine that your efforts aren't all wasted. Great gods, an amazing, immortal book that you sent, of course, to your Catullus so that he might immediately die on the best of all days in the Saturnalia. No, you won't get away with this crime. Now, when it's light enough, I'll run to the copyist's bookstalls. I'll acquire Caesius, Aquinius, Saphanus, all of the poisonous ones, and I'll repay you for this suffering. <laughs> Meanwhile, farewell. Take yourself off there. Whence your unlucky feet brought you, cursed one of the age, worst of poets. <laughs> so he gave him a book of crappy poetry. <laughs> yes. And the, there's sort of a, a complicated backline here. Calvis is a poet, but he's also an orator mm. and a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So what he's saying is one of your clients gave you this gift. Mm. And like, I'm glad you're getting something because remember, Roman po lawyers couldn't charge right. their elite. So they don't charge money. They just get gifts from mm. their clients. So one of his clients gave him this gift of a book of poetry. Do we know who, who wrote that poetry? Which, the one he doesn't like? Yeah. No, I, no, it's not clear. Right. So we know he liked the poetry of the guy who gave it to him. Yes, but not the poetry in uh, this. In this book, which he got from someone else. Sulla the Grammarian, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a long, complicated chain, and this yeah. is part of the sort of fun of it is like... Right. The, the, and this is the idea, and Marshall has that too, right, of re-gifting. Yeah. These are little gifts, so you might pass them along True. to other people. Uh, but he says, you gave me this poems, these poems, and it's and as soon as you got it, you turned around and gave me this book of poetry of this horrible so poet. Yeah. Joke gifts are a big part of the Saturnalia, right. it seems to. So he says, all right, I'm going to pay you back. And then he does name three poets, Caesius, Aquinas, and Saphanus. Saphanus he mentions he elsewhere like. as a poet he doesn't mm -hmm. like as well, that have horrible poetry. Right. And he's going to send them all the all the bad poets, and then that'll pay him back. Now, do, does the poetry of all these bad poets referenced, do they survive? No. No. Okay, so we don't know how bad they are. No, none of it survives. Uh, Calvus's poetry doesn't survive except in, I think, six words, maybe, hmm. in separate lines. <laughs> kind of hard to judge or, his yeah, talents no, we don't. That. We don't know Calvus's poetry. We don't know the bad poems, poets' poetry. Most of Catullus's circle, well, none of Catullus's circle survives intact. We've got little right. tiny quotations from some of his friends. Does, and does this guy that he likes, does he survive no, at all? No, that's Calvus, okay. no. That's Calvus, no. Okay. No. No, so we really have, we only have Catullus's <laughs> word for all of this, right, okay. which means he may be just slandering them all into, but anyway, that's, that's the Saturnalian gift. So okay. it's, you know, it's fun. And you can see there, it's all about pleasure and taking, you know, taking the mickey out of somebody and, and gifts that are about affection rather than value. Value. Right. And in a sense, you know, I'm, I've written on this poem, so I won't go too far into it, but he's kind of. Even by saying, oh, my God, this is a horrible book of poetry, he's expecting Calvus to get the joke, right? right? So what this is really doing is this is, it's like sending somebody a gag gift of something really right. tacky. So Calvus send it to him also knowing this is crappy poetry. That's, I'm going to give it to my poet friend. Yeah, that's what right. Catullus okay. is suggesting yeah. anyway. Right. Like but the way that the poem reads is that I understand this is all part of a big, like, right. we are all on the same side. We all understand the same things. Right. I can so, totally ha -ha, pay you back. you back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. as opposed to being, a, right. Got it. you know, and, and I think that, that that marks out, just like Christmas does now, you know, you mark your friend group mm -hmm. with the gifts that you give at Saturnalia. Right. Now you may also give them to your dependents and to slaves and things like that. So, sure. but there is a, a an affectionate element to it. Right. It's not just ritual and religion. So that's Saturnalia. And notice he calls it the best of all days. Right. So he likes it. The other thing I wanted to just mention, well, there's also the Lupercalia, which you mentioned in passing, but I don't really want to say too much about that. That isn't really connected with Christmas. Other than to say that it was also called the Dies Februatus, okay. the Lupercalia, because from um, purification, februum, there's debate about what that word means, but mm -hmm. it may have to do with fever, like when you sweat a lot and you purify yourself, uh, you know, from okay. sweating, purging, 
or it may have to do with uh, instruments which were uh, of purification that were ritual purification called februa. Okay. Either way, it gives us the word February. Right. And so the Lupercalia is the same festival that gives us the word fe- February. Okay. February, yes. So the only other one I wanted to bring up was Cupid. Mm. We've got Cupid as a sure. as a thing. So let me talk a little bit about Cupid, though I'm going to end up talking in part about Eros rather than Cupid. So those are the same things, right? Mm-hmm. The Greek god Eros, which means love, mm-hmm. and the translation in Latin, Latin is amor or cupidus, both of which mean love or desire. Mm-hmm. The interesting thing about Eros is that there are at least two seemingly separate gods Eros in Greek myth, one of whom is Protogenos, the firstborn mm-hmm. Eros, who's mentioned in Hesiod as being one of the primeval forces of the universe. So one of yes, the very first right. very first god who emerges self-formed at the dawn of creation. Right. So if you go to Hesiod's Theogony, so Mm -hmm. this is the poet um, writing in the 6th century, probably, maybe before BC, and he writes the Theogony, the Birth of the Gods, right at the beginning after he's sort of done his little preface about it, Mm -hmm. he talks about chaos. First, chaos came to be. That's the very first thing. Chaos is the gap, the -hmm. the chasm. But next, wide-bosomed Gaia, Mm -hmm. Earth, the ever sure foundation of the deathless ones who hold the peaks of snowy Olympus, and dim Tartarus. Mm-hmm. So you have Gaius, Tartarus, the pit in the depths of the wide path to earth, and Eros, love, mm. procreation, right. right? The force fairest among the deathless gods who unnerves the limbs and overcomes the mind and wise counsels of all gods and all men within them. In this view, it's the force of love or sexual desire, right. really, which is what which it I is. Which I guess is necessary because the progression of the creation story is generations. Procreative. Yes, exactly. So from then on, you get Gaia and Tartarus having sex and yeah. then producing. So, you know, because the the framework of creation from that point on is of sexual reproduction, right. you need Eros right at the beginning or else you would never have that. Right. So that's one Eros. And that Eros is a very sort of a primeval force, a primordial force mm-hmm. who's quite terrifying in mm-hmm. a sense. He's not only he sees not the only one. There's other people who mention him as a cosmological force. But then the other Eros, and the one that we normally associate with Cupid, right. is the Uranios Eros, but we won't get into the... There's a number of different kinds of Eros that are mentioned in Plato, for instance, but leaving that aside. Yeah, yeah. This is the Eros who is maybe the son of Aphrodite, yeah. or maybe a love god who was born at the same time as Aphrodite. Oh, okay. Or was born to Aphrodite from by Zeus, who is Aphrodite's father, father. in that okay. version of the story, though not in all versions of the story. So his birth, it can there are multiple versions, but he 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 accompanies. This is the one that is with Aphrodite. Yeah, that's the the most well known. Yeah, absolutely. Now, in some versions, after a while, in, especially in the Hellenistic period, he kind of multiplies and they become erotes, loves. Okay. But there's always one, the one who actually has any role in myth ever is sort of one, right. Eros. Mm-hmm. And he's the one who's often depicted, usually in, in vases, he's a handsome youth or maybe a child. Mm-hmm. He has bow and arrows or gifts, lover's gifts, mm-hmm. like a hair or flowers or something. Hair being like a rabbit hair. Right. Not yes. like, a, like a head of hair. No. Sometimes with wings, sometimes not. Right. And then... As time goes by, it's in the Hellenistic period that he starts to be portrayed more and more as a baby mm-hmm. or as a, as a young boy, not as a baby, but as a young boy. And it's in the and the Greek period continues. Uh, sorry, the Roman period continues that. So I thought I would do because I've only read one Latin poem, so I can't read. <laughs> two. I won't read it all. But there's a bo- poem by Ovid who gives us a really influential picture of love. Right. Unsurprisingly, Ovid's picture of what. Cupid looks it's like the that is the one that gets the Western tradition, the Western tradition yeah. gets the Renaissance pictures, right. you know. So book one um, of the Amores, poem two, so 1.2 of the Amores is essentially the triumph of Cupid. And he talks about how he's tossing and turning and he's been captured by love. So the first book, hmm. he says, uh, I tried to write epic, but I failed because Cupid stole a foot away and I had to write uneven lines. Right. And then he says, now I'm writing poems. And right at the end, he's like, well, I guess I need someone to write about now. So could you make me fall in love with someone? Because I need someone to write my love poems. So he right. becomes the poet before he gets the object of his affection. Then the second book, the second poem follows right on that. He's now in love. So now he's tossing and turning and he can't sleep. And the poem is about how 
Cupid leads him in triumph, like a Roman triumph, like a general triumphing over him right. through the streets. And in that, he describes Cupid in various terms. So I will just read a couple of some of the lines from through it. So he talks about the arrows. Mm -hmm. This becomes the, the thing. And later on, he talks in the Metamorphoses about the golden arrows that strike you with love and the lead tipped arrows that make you not love. So famously in the Daphne story, he strikes Apollo with the golden arrow mm -hmm. to make him fall in love with Daphne and Daphne with the leaden arrow to make her not want Apollo. Right. So that's why, just because he's trying to piss off Ar uh, Apollo, who said he was a better archer. <laughs> but in this one, he just has arrows and he says, and he carries torches, torches to burn you with love, to make your... You, on fire, but also because torches are the the lover goes through the streets at night carrying a mm -hmm. torch. And he says, look, look, I confess, Cupid, I'm your latest prize, st stretching out conquered arms towards your justice, right? He's a prisoner of war, taken mm -hmm. and captured, walked through the streets of Rome. Wreathe your hair with myrtle, yoke your mother's doves. So here he's the son of, of Aphrodite and mm -hmm. she has the dove as her mm -hmm. bird doves and sparrows your stepfather mars himself will lend you a chariot and it's fitting you go the people are claiming you tri your triumph with you skillfully handling the birds leading captive youths and captive girls that procession will be a magnificent triumph you'll lead conscience and shame with their hands twisted behind their back as prisoners because you've taken conscience and shame prisoner because everybody is shameless and has no right. conscience if you're a lover right. all will fear you stretching their arms to towards you you have your flattering followers' delusion and passion. Proudly, your mother will applaud your triumph from high Olympus and scatter roses over your head. You, with jeweled wings, jewels spangling your hair, will ride in a golden chariot, yourself all golden. And then, if I know you, you'll inflame not a few, and also, passing by, you'll deal out many wounds. Such was Bacchus in the conquered land by Ganges, you drawn by birds, he by tigers. So since I will be part of your sacred triumph, victorious one, spend your powers frugally on me now. Look at Caesar's similar fortunes of war. What he conquers, he protects with his power. So be as kind to your conquered peoples as Augustus is. Augustus conquers everyone and then makes takes care of them afterwards, like right. the good father he is. So if you're going to conquer me, then at least take care of me afterwards. Right. So a little political sting in the tail there. Right. So golden, bejeweled, chariot of birds, and winged, mm -hmm. right? And with arrows, that's the Cupid that makes its way into later right. uh, conceptions. I don't know that that makes a particularly o obvious reindeer name. <laughs> <laughs> Other than the winged yeah. element, I suppose, Flies, yeah. swift and winged. Mm -hmm. But yes, other than that. <laughs> anyway, so they get conflated, the originating Eros and the later Eros, of mm -hmm. course. But it, it is interesting that there's these very different kind of conceptions of them as this awesome primeval force and as this playful, youth. petty youth. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much all I have. There's not a lot of classical stuff. This is a very Germanic topic yeah. <laughs> in terms of the, the words and the names yeah. and reindeer. Yes. Which I don't have a lot to say about Latin and Greek reindeer. <laughs> really don't have much to go on with that. So do you want to talk a little more about reindeer themselves? Then? Yes. Just some interesting other uses of the word reindeer in Christmas contexts. Right. So do you know the term reindeer rule? No. Well, it basically refers to court challenges, or it's about court challenges to Christmas observances by government bodies okay. in the U.S. Okay. So because of this idea of... Separation of separ church and state. Yeah. There shouldn't be, therefore, government bodies... Celebrating, celebrating religious, religious or marking things. religious marking things. Yeah. Okay. And indeed, you know, legal challenges have been made where they have broken this. Alleging that a government entity has been celebrating Christmas and yeah. therefore is... Yeah. So, for instance, there in uh, 1969, the American Civil Liberties Union sued over uh, the inclusion of a crash, a sort of um, nativity, the nativity scene, scene yeah. at the National Community Christmas Tree. Okay. So the Christmas tree was okay, but the crash was not. But the crash was not. Was not. Right. Yes. And this will become important. Right. No, I can see that. You know, and so there are various and challenges they, like Did this. they win? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. Though I could be wrong about that. But the crucial one is a challenge that the ACLU made in 1983. Okay. They sued over a municipal, a municipal nativity scene in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. 
But eventually, when it sort of came to that, the Supreme Court decided that the presence of secular elements such as Santa Claus, elves, reindeer, and so forth, had diluted the religious content sufficiently. To make it a, a cultural rather yes. than religious yeah, that is my element. understanding of it. Okay, yes. So that's the reindeer rule. And if so you stick enough since, reindeer in yeah, it, it makes it secular. Ever since, that has been referred to as the, the reindeer rule. Yeah, Because Jesus definitely wasn't on a reindeer. So yes. there's no way you can pretend that it's the same thing. Now, nevertheless, okay. many organizations, not only government ones, but you know, private companies, mm -hmm. have sort of moved away from very explicitly religious Christmas holiday elements marking yeah yeah and of course this has sparked the whole idea about the supposed war on christmas which in particular he didn't really start it but it was made you know a very famous thing by bill o'reilly yes indeed he was he sort of got the idea from a book that had been pub published earlier but he he, he publicized the idea that yeah. there was a war on christmas yes so i just wanted to point out linguistically mm -hmm. um you know, a lot of the things that people complain about are, you know, using non-Christian phrases or elements like reindeer or whatever, and they see this as sort of denying the denying the religious. Of the, yeah. yeah. So for, somehow it somehow it prevents anyone who wants to celebrate a religious Christmas from doing so in some way that I have never fully understood. That if somebody says something not religious to you, you are then un unable to celebrate yeah. a religious event. I mean, obviously. I'm going to just play my show my hand here. I think it's all ludicrous, <laughs> utterly ludicrous. Like even if it were and is intentional, even if people mm -hmm. are trying to, it's still ludicrous to care about it. But yes. go on. <laughs> so if you've ever had anyone complain about you saying, you know, happy holidays or whatever, mm -hmm. this, is, this is exactly the point. So the phrase season's greetings. Let's yes. start with that. Right. Which people complain about. Um, season's greetings instead of Merry Christmas. Mer Merry Christmas. Yeah. So actually, this phrase is actually used more in terms of greeting cards and advertisements than it is spoken. You don't really go to someone and say season's greetings. No, I mean, you no. could, but you'd say happy holidays, you'd say but, happy not holidays but not season no. greetings. Yeah. And in fact, it, it goes back a long way. So it dates back to Victorian times. Mm -hmm. Which is when Christmas cards date it back to, yeah. period, right? Yeah. I mean, And that seems to be where it came from, actually, is the whole Christmas card thing. Right. Again, there's this sort of complaint that, you know, Obama or, you know, one of these lefty <laughs> Warren Christmas presidents, you know, using this instead Banned of saying, it. Yeah. yeah. In fact, it has been used by many presidents in their White House Christmas cards, mm -hmm. including Eisenhower all the way back in 1955. Right. So. Okay. As for happy holidays, mm -hmm. it similarly has been in use for more than 100 years. It seems to date back to sort of the mid-19th century in the U.S., it's particularly a U.S. Mm -hmm. phrase, and is widely represented regionally. So it's not just a, you know, kind of, I don't know. D.C. liberals. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, you know, northern. No, yeah, or northeastern whatever. or something. Yeah, yeah. northeastern thing. Um, but, you know, was used in various places mm -hmm. in the U.S., so again, it's not a, it's not, not an a new, innovation, it, it's right? not That's an the innovation. Thing. That's the point. Yeah. It's not an innovation. Yeah. And as I've pointed out before in previous podcast episodes and videos, um, it was actually the Puritans who were the, who waged the real war on Christmas. Yes. Though they didn't ban it quite as much as I think we said in that video. A, with, Oliver Cromwell didn't do quite as much as I think some people credit him with doing. He didn't ban mince pies and he didn't. No, but they definitely But they definitely did, it and didn't approve and of didn't approve. general Christmas mm -hmm. uh, celebrations. No. They were not in, yeah. they just weren't into celebrating holidays. No. And this includes the Puritans in colonial America yeah. who, you know, the, the, the Plymouth pilgrims, mm -hmm. right? So we're going right back to, you know, the very mm -hmm. early days here. In 1620, they spent their very first Christmas day in the new world working, mm -hmm. building a structure, their first structure in the new world, not celebrating or anything mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So... They probably weren't saying happy holidays, though, to be fair. <laughs> no. So, you know. They were probably saying, you know, work. It's good. <laughs> Do more work. Show, show your love for the Lord and your work. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, yes. That that was all just a sort of a tangent coming out of this reindeer Warren, rule. Yeah, reindeer rule. Okay. Thing. But anyways, uh, I'm sure we'll come back to the topic <laughs> again. So, there you go. Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about is, so 
you know, reindeer, as you know, is clear from that video. And as you said, this is a very northern mm -hmm. kind of Germanic-y mm -hmm. thing. You know, it doesn't... Mm -hmm. Or Scandinavian or and Scandinavian Germanic. Or yeah. or whatever. I just don't want to leave the fin and, fins in this um, swamp. Um, well, then, then you can't say... the Sami out. Yeah, I know. Yes, so you can't it's say not Scandinavian. Scandinavian. It's Nordic. Scandifinian, Finniscandian. Well, Nordic. Yeah, Nordic. Anyway. Inclusive the, term. And, and the, well, yes. the, uh, do the Sami count as Nordic? I mean... Probably. I don't know. Northern... There's lots of indigenous peoples in, yeah. in Norway and Finland mm -hmm. and Russia who use reindeer as well. Sure. So all of this stuff. Anyway, yes. Yeah. Not Roman is really what I'm trying Not to say. Not Roman, <laughs> yes. Not most parts of the world. Yes. That's the point. So there is a kind of tradition of having regionally appropriate animals <laughs> substituted for the reindeer. In pulling Santa sleigh tradition, yes. pulling Santa sleigh, or in the um, last sort of hundred years, you yes, mean, because since, of course the whole Santa yeah. thing is, you know, it was an invention really of these twentieth yeah, century of these um, mm -hmm. Pintard and Washington Irving and mm -hmm. so forth. So you know, it's a new thing. Why not change it, adapt up? it? But there's, in addition to those sort of substitutions, there's also completely separate local traditions that don't really connect with Saint Nicholas or Santa Claus or whatever. Right, but. There is still a, a figure of a sort of gift giver, Who's, holiday gift giver, right. who is rides on something or, or is pulled yes, by something or yes. is in some way conveyed. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do a little quiz. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'll, the, the first one is a bit of a giveaway, right? So the do you remember the Netherlands? The Netherlands is the white horse Amerigo. Yes. Yes. So, and by the way, if you've watched the video Americano before. Yes. You will know the etymology of the name Amerigo. It comes from Amalric, uh, yes. Germanic, common Germanic name. So the horse is not named after America. This is No, root. it's yes. not, but it's from the same root as yes, America. Cognate with cognate America. Cognate with America. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that Germanic name, Amal means work or labor, and Reek means power, so work power. I don't know. No, a workhorse. Workhorse. Yeah, yeah, that's appropriate. Horse power. <laughs> was also, as I say, a very common personal name. Yeah, I know. But I mean, it, when it means you, you're riding a horse named like Strong. Yes. Basically. Yeah, yeah. It's a good right? name for a horse yeah. too. Yeah. 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 And yes, this Amerigo becomes America because of Amerigo Vespucci. Okay. So that one's easy. What would you guess is the animal in Australia? <laughs> well, that one I know <laughs> because our kids have sung the song. At uh, the Christmas right, concerts or other kids at the Christmas mm -hmm. concerts. Eight white boomers. Boomers, specifically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so they're kangaroos, but kangaroos. they're known as boomers. The boomers are the male kang. It's a term for the okay. male kangaroos. Right. Yeah. And I guess he would be referred to as Father Christmas, specifically. Though Australia, probably, a, bit, a bit like Canada, Australia kind of goes both ways, the depending. Yeah, they sometimes they go Christmas uh, yeah. British and sometimes they go yeah. American. Yeah. All right. What would you imagine are the animals in Louisiana? Louisiana. Think, alligators? Think swampy alligators. <laughs> yes. I, I was I, I was trying to stop myself from saying crocodiles. <laughs> <laughs> Came up with the right animal and then I was like, no, 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 those are in Africa. Yes. Okay. Alligators. So alligators. So, All right. Uh, so they I would, of course, know. <laughs> you know, call him by the French Père Noël. Mm -hmm. We're talking Louisiana here. So, and he would, uh, Père Noël would be in a uh, pirogue, which is a kind of dugout canoe. Oh, right. Okay. Pulled by alligators and a red-nosed werewolf. <laughs> I cannot believe these are actual traditions. I think like the, San, uh, like the Australian kind of one is sort of, you know, modern up, and yeah. kind of, um, yes, humorous. Yes. All right. Well, what do you think about in Spain and Latin, many countries in Latin America? This is one of the ones where it's not Santa Claus. Right. And it's actually traditional, not like mm -hmm. made up for a silly song. Um, is it St. Nicholas, though? It's not St. Nicholas. Not St. No. Nicholas, no. I feel like I've, you know, these are these things you read in listicles and stuff. I feel like I've heard of this, but I don't remember what it is. Right. If, if I give you the clue that it's, in fact, the Three Kings. Oh, of course. Okay. So it's the Magi. Mm -hmm. They ride camels? Camels, yeah. So three ah, kings come on their South camels. South American and camels. Give gifts. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Probably are camels in South right. America now. I mean, if there's camels in Australia. <laughs> All right. What about Switzerland, or at least parts of Switzerland? Skis? <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, this one is hard. It, it's not all that necessarily obvious from the region, but and it's it's is it Santa Claus or are we talking a uh, different figure? I think it's 
I'm not positive, but I think it's it's like it's Saint, Saint Nicholas, Nicholas. anyway. Okay. Yeah. So it's similar to the I don't know Saint horses. Nicholas. Yeah. Donkey. Donkey. Oh, okay. No, that, that's that's specific. That's that's yep. different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Just comes on a donkey. He doesn't not a cart. I think so. Donkey. Yeah. I think yeah, it's a single a donkey. donkey. Yeah. yeah. All right. Here's a hard one. Czech Republic. This is weird. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, I have such long and intimate knowledge of the Czech Republic. Um, Czech There's Czech actually kind of two figures involved in this. It's not a Zwart Peter, is it? No. Good. No, well, that's that's uh, that's I know that's Netherlands. I just yeah. wondered if there's one. Um, I don't know. So one of the figures is called Mikulas, which is Nicholas Saint uh-huh. Nick, but he is described as coming accompanied by an angel Ooh. who descends from heaven on a golden cord. Oh, well, I mean, I should have come up with that. That was obvious. <laughs> I mean, if I was in Czechoslovakia, I'd totally drop in on a golden cord. <laughs> okay. Germany. Uh, Germany. I don't know. Uh, horses again? Not horses, though that would be a good guess. Um, so Weihnachtsmann is oh who he's yeah okay to, Weinox, just yeah like Christmas dude yeah um, <laughs> who just walks oh it's a kind of German you know functional just get there do what you need to do <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> very practical okay all right what about Italy this is a this is a weird one oh, I feel like I've heard this one mm. this is very different from all of the others is it Saint Nicholas no it's a completely separate figure. Is it a woman? It is. Does she ride a cat? Not a cat. That was my that was but my guess. <laughs> that's actually, in some ways, a good guess. No, she she comes on a broom. So oh, this is very oh, Halloween. I have sounding. seen. I have seen this. She she's not a Baba something. That's a that's that's yes, Eastern. Yes, close. Is she Baba? Bethana. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, I have. I yes. yeah. God knows when I've heard it talked about, but yes. So she's depicted as an old hag. Mm-hmm. Comes on a broom, uh, and, but on brings broom gifts, like a witch. But brings gifts. But brings gifts on uh, Epiphany Eve. Okay. Okay. All right. This next one, I think you'll have an easier, somewhat easier time guessing. Hawaii. Oh, well. Um, Santa rides a coconut. <laughs> <laughs> he rides a volcano. <laughs> Lava beast. This is Santa, though, right? Yeah. Because there's no, there's no tradition in no, Hawaii no, of a winter no. festival. So is, you don't do that in equatorial. Of, yeah, and this is an adaptation tropical. of Santa. Yeah. Um, I know parrots. <laughs> <laughs> Again, he comes in a in a dugout canoe. Oh, in a canoe. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Wearing a toque and a lava lava skirt. Grass like grass skirt, basically. Yeah. But a toque. You know, contra- that that sort of tension between it's the very Canadian the toque and the yeah. <laughs> so they actually call it a toque. Interesting. Okay. And the last one, Brazil. Mm. He comes on a samba float. <laughs> Santa wears a bikini and um, <laughs> all I'm doing is exposing my deep stereotyped prejudice and uh, stereotypes about <laughs> the countries around the world here. This is really bad. This is just exposing my ignorance and prejudices. Um You'll, you won't be able to guess know. this one. <laughs> it's kind of crazy, this one. So he's referred to as Papai Noel. Okay. Which is probably Portuguese. Yes. pronounced that way. <laughs> pronounced more Portuguese. <laughs> Papai Noel, but Portuguese. But Portuguese, yes. yeah. He comes in a helicopter. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, no, I, do, I was not going to guess that. No. <laughs> So there you go. And if you have any more details, <laughs> listeners, about any of the ones that I mentioned and wish to, to uh, you know, correct any <laughs> misstatements. misstatements there, or if you know of any other uh, interesting yeah. animals who accompany or <laughs> transport their the Christmas gift giver, let us know. Cool. <laughs> And the last thing I want to end off on is to talk about the NORAD reindeer tracking and the history of this <laughs> oh, tradition. Yeah. Right. So as you may or may not know, NORAD every year. NORAD is. NORAD is the North. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's look it up just to be sure. Putting you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, just... the funny thing is, I'll have another acronym later that I do know. <laughs> See, we grow up in North America. Like, I remember NORAD ah, as right. a thing, but. <laughs> Except 
except it's changed its name. I, I did know this. It's now called the North American Aerospace Defense Command, which has nothing to do with the letters in NORAD. In NORAD right. <laughs> well, maybe it's just North American Aerospace Defense? Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, yeah. North American... Yes, that's what it is. I've just found it. Uh, North American Aerospace Defense Command, or right. NORAD Command. Right. Until 1981 as North American Air Defense Command. Right. Okay, there we go. So every year they post through various media, which have changed over the years, obviously, the uh, sort of tracking of Santa Claus's progress. Like, yeah. Over Christmas Eve, as he goes around the world, starting at the far, like starting as Christmas yes. Eve starts yeah. around the world. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing about this is the tradition actually started well before NORAD existed, hmm. and it was only later came to NORAD mm -hmm. to continue. Well, there's there's kind of two origin stories here. Well, there's two origins, two actual origins, and w the second origin story has been Questions? embellished <laughs> right but the first one is that on december 24th 1948 the united states air force issued a communique claiming that and i quote here an early warning radar net to the north had detected one unidentified sleigh powered by eight reindeer at 14,000 feet which is 4,300 meters, uh, <laughs> heading 180 degrees. And that was the, the first time that an, an American government body reported on, on Santa. Santa. Right. Okay. Yeah. And in fact, the Associated Press passed this report along to the general public. So it was a nice sort of feel-goody thing right. to do. It was only a one-time event, though. It was not repeated. Right. So years passed after that one, one incident. So some years later, in 1955, the actual yearly tradition started as a separate thing. Mm -hmm. In this year, according to legend, let's mm -hmm. say, uh, the sort of doctored version of the story anyways, <laughs> a Sears department store placed an advertisement in a Colorado Springs newspaper uh, which told children that they could place a call to Santa Claus and talk with him <laughs> and gave a phone number. Mm. So they had obviously set up. A thing as a desk promotional whatever, thing. Yeah, yeah. And the phone number they gave was ME2-6681. And I know nothing about American <laughs> phone number systems, but... Okay. <laughs> Anyways, supposedly there was a misprint in this ad and one digit was different. And so as a result, a call came through to the Colorado Springs Continental Air Defense Command, CONAD, okay. is the acronym. And there are various versions of this story, but in some versions of the story, the calls came into the red telephone, <laughs> which was the uh, hotline that connected Conad directly to the authorities at the Strategic Air Defense Command. So totally not possible. Yes. No, yeah. <laughs> it was it was a direct line. It was not connected to the phone system. Right. <laughs> but that's, that's the, the story. That's the story. It because it's more it fun that better, way. Yeah. Yep. And Colonel Harry Shoup, who was the crew commander on duty at the time, answered the, the first call and supposedly told his staff to give all the children who phoned this number the current location of Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. Now, as I say, this is an embellished story. The, the actual story seems to be more like this. On November 30th, sometime before mm -hmm. uh, Christmas, one child tried to reach Santa Claus on this number, but misdialed. So right. it wasn't that there was a misprint. It was just one child misdialing the number and reached Shoop at his desk. Hmm. So it wasn't the a normal line. line. It was just, a, just an ordinary phone, you know, his desk phone. And Shoop seems to have responded gruffly to the child at first. You know, you've got the wrong number. Mm -hmm. And there were no additional Santa Claus related calls. It was yeah. just a fluke of one missile. However, when a member of Shoop's staff placed a picture of Santa Claus on the board that is used to track unidentified aircraft in December, mm -hmm. some weeks later, Shoop thought that this might be a good public relations opportunity. And so he asked Con. Uh, Conad's public relations officer, one Colonel Barney Oldfield, to inform the press that Conad was tracking Santa Claus's sleigh. Right. And so in his release to the press, Oldfield added that Conad 
Army, Navy, and Marine Air Forces will continue to track and guard Santa and his sleigh on his trip to and from the US against possible attack from those who do not believe in Christmas. Which sounds kind of <laughs> funny and innocuous, but yeah. now would mean... Yeah. It probably at the time didn't actually mean like Muslims, mm. probably meant maybe commie Communists. reds, yeah. right? Yeah. But now that same line yeah, yeah. would read very differently, <laughs> though also <laughs> wasn't great at the time either. Yeah. But yes. They probably thought it was cute and funny, but yeah. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> So over the years, the the legend of how, uh, you know, the, this annual event originated began to change and become embellished. And that's how it we get these, these various yeah. versions of the story. In fact, Shoup di didn't intend to, you know, repeat this as an annual tradition. So in, in 1956, the next year, he it wasn't, planning, it to wasn't do it. planning to do it. But Oldfield, that staff member informed him that the Associated Press and uh, United Press International were awaiting reports from Conad. They were, they were, so the, you <laughs> they know, the, the press services thing, yeah. were, want, you know, wanted a, you know, another report. Mm -hmm. And so Shoup agreed that Oldfield should right. do it again, announce it, announce his progress and mm -hmm. so forth. And the, you know, it became an annual tradition after that. Right. And now, of course, it's on Twitter. Well, yes. But before we get to there. Okay, sorry. So in 1958, the North American Air Defense Command, NORAD, mm -hmm. um, took over the reporting responsibilities from CONAD, mm -hmm. and the reporting became more and more elaborate over the years, to the point that now, mm -hmm. uh, well, as of 2008, NORAD started a Twitter account, yep. NORAD Santa, yep. at NORAD Santa. I have... I have, I don't know that I follow it, but I have definitely checked it. Yes. <laughs> In which they give like, not just one report, but like yeah, min, the, updates. Uh, yeah. Not minute the, by minute, yeah. but like, yeah. yeah. And there are, in fact, uh, there, there's still a, a hotline you can phone to get, you know, an actual Up, update. update. <laughs> yeah. And it, and it, it's become quite elaborate now. They've used, you know, various Google resources to figure out when to expect the highest call volume so that they can plan right. to have the resources at any one time to answer all the calls. and So it's PR, but basically now this is like an important thing. fundable yes. element yes. of yes. their <laughs> year. Right. And it's sort of funny for the PR too, because it's sort of like, what, what, what PR well, are you, you doing? PR like for, for NORAD? But we're yeah. making everybody be happy that we've got a militarized and we're all being watched over. Watch. <laughs> like, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> I guess maybe it does need PR. Maybe that explains the uh, however many trillions of dollars of uh, unaccountable military spending there was announced in recent days. <laughs> it's all it's all on on it's telephone all Santa operators <laughs> answering Santa calls. I wish that were true. <laughs> if I could believe that, I would be fine with it. Those are jobs I'm happy to create. <laughs> so, anyways, you can you can enjoy your. Christmas Eve by uh, tracking, tracking Santa, Santa around the world around the world through Twitter. Very good. All right. Well, I think that's more than enough on Santa and reindeer <laughs> because we've been talking for quite a while. But good. Now we know so much about the, the reindeer. reindeer. Yes. You can tell everybody so many things over Christmas <laughs> dinner. Avoid talking about all the other things nobody wants to talk about with family at Christmas this year by Just telling about everybody reindeer. about reindeer. And the fact that they're all women. women. Well, they aren't women. They're female, female reindeers. <laughs> There's a fairly important difference. Yeah. <laughs> and most of them aren't actually reindeer. Mm -hmm. There are other animals foxes in disguise. And wolves or and, yeah. Yeah. Gods. Yeah. And with that, happy holidays. And season's greetings. <laughs> and we'll be back in the new year with a number of interviews. Indeed. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. 
We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.